Hi everybody, I'm Rick Hansen, neuropsychologist and author of Buddha's Brain, and I'm here today with my friend and colleague Janine Roth, the author of multiple New York Times bestsellers, a uh, frequent guest on Oprah when she was having her show, and other various top-tier shows like that. And Janine has done very groundbreaking work in people's relationships with obsessions or addictions of various kinds, and using those as doorways to healing, self-fulfillment, self-actualization, and, if it's of interest, spirituality. Uh, her work was among the very first to link compulsive eating and dieting to deeper issues, personal issues and spiritual issues, that go way beyond food, body image, and dieting. Um, she thinks that the way that we eat is the way we live, and that our relationship to food, money, and love is a perfect reflection of our deeply held beliefs about ourselves and the amount of joy, abundance, pain, scarcity, and suffering we believe we have or need to have in our lives. Rather than pushing away our behavior as crazy or ashamed or shameful or something like that, Janine thinks that it's a great opportunity to discover ourselves and grow, uh, particularly if we start by accepting it and looking into its deeper wisdom. Uh, as I said, she's been on many important shows of various kinds. She has a wonderful website, by the way, JanineRoth.com, that's chock full of resources. And she puts on online retreats uh, all year long, and she does two personal retreats every year. And you can learn more about her and her books and her resources at Janine, that's spelled G-E-N-E-E-N -E -E Roth, R-O-T-H, JanineRoth.com. Uh, and that's where you can find out more about her. So, Janine. Welcome. I'm very glad that you're here today. I'm really glad to be here, too. That's it's great. a pleasure. That's great. And always a pleasure to be with you, Rick. Oh, that's great. That's sweet. Well, as you can probably tell, because Janine's uh, uh, interview is in the middle of the series, we're doing this physically in a different way, partly because her work is so much focused on relationships. I thought that it would be a wonderful way to do this, face-to-face, -face, actually. And so this is a different format for us. I hope you'll bear with any little technical glitches. But I think this will be very good, very cool. I really like it, too. <laughs> great, it's more real. I, right? like, I like being with you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's very, very mutual. Yeah, good. All right, so this um, series, as you know, is about love and the brain, broadly defined. And so I'll start with a question I ask everybody, which is, um, why has it been important to you personally to become more skillful in your relationships? Well, I think when I am not skillful in my relationships and everyone around me suffers, and I suffer as well. Mm -hmm. So I have felt for a very long time that it's important to be conscious about what I'm doing, what I'm feeling, what I'm saying, how I am, how I interpret what's going on. Yeah. And in that way, I feel much better in myself, and I think people around me are a lot happier, too. Mm, that's great. So if you don't mind saying, uh, again, a question I ask everybody, uh, what's a personal issue in relationships that you've grappled with, and how? what have you learned around it, and how did you deal with it? I'd say the, the, the biggest one, and it's been both ways, both for myself in terms of... Uh, Intra personally and also between me and somebody else has been blame. The way that I blame myself and make myself wrong about something and feel terrible, less than, and or if I'm not doing that, the way I have blamed other people. Mm. So for my own suffering. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's been a very big one for me to work with and to become aware of, to name and become aware of, mm -hmm. and how, is the next question, how have I worked with this? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. yeah, what did you do with it? Yeah. One thing that I did is realize how hard I was on myself, mm -hmm. and how vicious I actually was to myself, and that took a lot of awareness and naming, uh, because I had to be aware of um, the effect of it before I actually became aware of the voice. So I noticed I was collapsed or weak or small or diminished, uh, felt terrible. And then I 
I started grappling with that voice inside myself. So the, the voice you're referring to is what? Is, well, you could call it the superego. In my work, I call it the voice. You it's, don't mean some kind of psychotic process. No. <laughs> schizophrenic voices. No, no. You mean a very normal I thing mean, that people in general have. Yeah. People in general have this, no matter what you do, it's not good enough. You're not resting enough. How come, you lazy bum? Get up off wait, your head. Wait, 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 wait. What are you doing? Get out of my head. <laughs> right. How did you know? <laughs> right, exactly. You're resting too much. <laughs> don't you, what, what's your, you know, don't you know there are children to save? And so it's, it's. You're really in my head now. <laughs> it's that voice. And then how I deal with that voice as it's related to other people. My, uh -huh. you know, the tendency to blame somebody else. And what I've had to pull back on is that I see that in blaming someone else, it's that voice turned outwards, just like that. But it's also interpreting what they've done in a particular way and mm. then seeing that my reaction of blame is based on my interpretation. Mm. So, so now that you're aware of the, the voice, so the nightmare is even worse because the voice is now louder, right? Okay, then what did you do? I, How do you get free of the voice or reduce the voice I, or use the voice better? Yes. Well, I named it is number one so that I became separate from it and disidentified from it mm -hmm. so that I no longer felt like it was me yeah. and it was speaking the truth. It was a conditioned voice. It was based on my history. Mm -hmm. It was based on how... Uh, what I learned in my environment, how I was talked to, or how I saw people talking to mm -hmm. each other, and I became vigilant about stopping it. Mm -hmm. Just plain old stopping that voice, and, and then when I started putting it out there, I, I, I became aware of how I was interpreting what other people were doing and, and saying. Interpreting? Same by word by, by that. that I mean... Mm -hmm. Let's say my husband comes in late. We're supposed Husbands to. Husbands never do that. <laughs> he's supposed to get home at 6 and he's there at 6.30. And I can start on a story about he's not keeping his agreements. Mm. He said he was going to be here. He always does this. You know, just schlep the past into the present moment. Go off on a little gallop on my interpretation about why he's walking in the door at 6.30 mm -hmm. and then have a lot of feelings based on that. Mm -hmm. I'm hurt, I'm angry, mm -hmm. I'm, I don't feel valued by him. Yeah. Hurt and angry are actually feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and so I became aware of that process of the what happened, the interpretation mm -hmm. or the story I'm telling myself, mm -hmm. my fantasy of what mm -hmm. happened and then my feelings based on my fantasy. So you became more, more aware of these processes. Okay. And then I checked them and out. And you became more separated from them. Yeah. Disidentified was your term. Yes. So, okay, fine. So now you're more aware of them, and you're more you know, separated from them. Then what? How do you get them to diminish? Well, in the, in the case of a relationship mm -hmm. with someone else, I check it out. If it's somebody I'm very close to, mm -hmm. I'm able to say, like my husband, I'm able to say, when you walked in late, my fantasy was, mm -hmm. I, I actually take myself through a checklist mm -hmm. because I find that it helps me own my own reactivity mm -hmm. instead of project it on someone else. And so mm -hmm. I, I just ask, is it true? So, so I, when you walked mm -hmm, in late mm -hmm. and I felt like you weren't actually keeping your agreement and you, or you forgot. My mm -hmm. fantasy was you forgot. Mm -hmm. Let's just make it very mm -hmm. simple. And so I check it out. Did you forget? Yeah. And then he gets a chance to say, no, in fact, I was actually picking up something you had asked me to pick up. And then pff, there goes that whole thing I've constructed about right. my feelings based on my imagination right. of what happened. Okay. How about with yourself, though? If that voice is blaming yourself, so it's not external, it's not your husband you're blaming. You're blaming yourself for not working hard enough or weighing too much or eating too much or not, you know, succeeding in your career enough or whatever it is, right? That voice is going off on you. You're more aware of it. You're now separated from it. What do you do then with it? 
it, when it's it, directed at yourself. Well, the first thing I always do, as I said, is name it and realize that voice is not my friend. That regardless of what that mm. voice is saying, mm. it is not my friend. No good will come from listening to that voice. No good. So Be you're taking a stand with regard to I it. I am absolutely you're, taking you're, a stand. You're getting on your own side about it and saying, hey, you're, you're an affliction on me in a sense. You're not my friend. You're, you may be well-intended in some weird way, but your impact is not good for me. Yes, because that voice is always some kind of truth mixed with moral judgment. Mm -hmm. And so it's the moral judgment. You're resting too much. You're too lazy. And therefore, that makes you bad. That mm -hmm. makes you a failure. And so I get to, when I separate the judgment from the mm -hmm. truth, and I can only do that if I'm willing to separate mm -hmm. from the whole effect of that voice, mm -hmm. then I can say to myself, is it actually true that I'm resting too much? Or mm -hmm. is this a half an hour nap we're talking about? Mm -hmm. And so I think the first part is realizing, naming it, realizing it's not my friend no matter what. Mm -hmm. And then, and that happens a lot with people who are eating a lot too. I shouldn't have eaten that much. If I had, if I had just stopped, then I would have been able to. And then they make themselves feel worse and worse. And then what do they do? Because then they start feeling shame. Mm -hmm. or they start feeling worthless. I mean, the whole combination of worthless and shame. Yeah. And then what do they do? They eat more to make themselves mm -hmm. feel better because now they feel so bad that they turn to food for comfort. Yeah. So it's a cycle that just has to stop. So how do you distinguish between, let's call it toxic blame, and um, healthy remorse, or healthy uh, self-encouragement, like, you know, come on... You do need to, like for me, I need to exercise more, right? And so how do I distinguish between, let's say, that um, toxic blame voice, bad, 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 right? And the part of me goes, dude, you got to run. You got to exercise or don't be a schlub. Come on, right? How do you tease those apart? Well, I'm going to talk in a very basic way about that right now, mm -hmm. and uh, which is the way that I've been thinking about it recently. Mm -hmm within my own life for instance with writing mm -hmm. I love writing and I'm not really working on a particular book right now mm -hmm. but I do like to write and it and in order to get myself out to my studio every day mm -hmm. and sit and write for an hour when it's so easy to get involved in mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. something else a phone call a mm -hmm. juicy phone call or mm -hmm. um, I keep asking myself what do I love what do I really love? Mm -hmm. What makes me happy? Mm -hmm. In your case, maybe it's feeling good in your body mm -hmm. makes you happy. Mm -hmm. So then you have to go back to, oh, mm -hmm. this is a That's way. Great. That's great, Janine. Yeah. You're going okay. back to a source of a wholesome desire. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What do you love? I mean, mm -hmm. I know you would say it another way yeah, no. than I do. I said it just how yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I and that's how I work with people too. What do you love? Yeah, um, but what about occasions where people really do deserve healthy remorse, and it's good for them? In other words, they they did overreact. They did kick the dog. They did um, drink too much. They did flare at other people. They have been lazy, let's say, and they have dropped the ball. They have let themselves down or let other people down. You know, there's a real place for that. Um, how do you sort that out from toxic blame? Well, what I know about situations like that, and I can see it in my own life, and I can also see it with my students, mm. what I absolutely know is that shame and blame do not lead to change. So if your goal here mm -hmm. is to actually see what you're doing mm -hmm. and ask yourself, was that effective? Mm -hmm. Do I want to act like that? Did I actually hurt somebody in the mm -hmm. process? Mm -hmm. Did my actions contribute mm -hmm. to more harm? Mm -hmm. What I know is that kicking yourself for mm -hmm. kicking the dog mm -hmm. doesn't help you stop kicking the dog. Mm -hmm. But actually some kind of witnessing mm -hmm. and some kind of questioning process either with somebody else so are you saying that you don't think that 
guilt or remorse are at all no I think place? remorse is important okay yeah I think remorse I'm sorry so how do you sort out the difference between um, healthy remorse and toxic blame when you feel worse and then you do it again to make yourself feel better I mm, would say that that's, that's a clue. toxic is that a clue <laughs> that's a clue huh okay good I think the difference and you know Brene Brown says this uh, guilt <clears throat> is um, I did it wrong shame is I am wrong yeah and so there has to be or that bad. that yeah bad. Guilt is I did something bad. Shame is I am bad. Yeah. yeah. So if it globalizes you're, it. If you're into I am bad, mm -hmm. then you're gonna walk around and you're mm -hmm. gonna feel terrible, and change is gonna become impossible at that yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. We're already in the rich territory. Okay. Deep <laughs> into the pool. Okay. So this is good. That's so that's a really good dense foundation. We did that great. Um, you're especially known for your work on originally food, diet, and so forth. And so, um, since our focus here is on relationships, and since so many people, I mean, I'm a guy, obviously, but I have been told many times that women do get concerned about appearance, and I can see the cultural impact of that, because I'm a staunch feminist and all. Um, Kim, why don't you just walk us through for a few minutes some of the ways in which girls, let's say, we'll start with girls, maybe we'll extend to guys pretty soon, Girls growing up um, come to form of views or feelings about how they look, and including related to what they eat, that then spill out into and affect their relationships. So maybe you can walk us through some of the causes of those processes, uh, certainly through adolescence and maybe even reaching back when girls are even younger. You wanna, can we do that? Yes, we can. Right. Although I want to say I'm not an expert on girls. Mm -hmm. even though I was one, was one. Um, yeah. uh, and even though I developed my own eating disorder when I was 11 yeah. and in fact 80 percent of fourth grade girls are on diets and they believe they're too fat so this is an epidemic I know it's very sad you're talking about American girls right? yes Amer I'm yeah. this is a problem in the West yeah this is a problem with people mm -hmm. who have enough to eat only people who have enough to eat can compulsively eat mm -hmm. so it's good to sort of yep. set the groundwork mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. um, so it's not my expertise most of my work in the last 30 35 years has been with women yeah. 18 years and older okay fine um, what I would say about girls is that because we live and ever increasingly mm -hmm. in a image oriented culture in which what you look like determines or mm -hmm. supposedly determines mm -hmm. who you are or the way I would say it is that the size of your body mm -hmm. equals the size of your life the, the, mm -hmm. the, the life you're allowed to have mm -hmm. You're saying, that especially for women. That especially for women, but girls, and and girls yeah. start right there too. When a girl is fat, mm. then she's ostracized. Mm. She's made fun of. She's yeah. And then she feels bad about herself, and then she eats more. Mm. And then the dieting starts. And most of the people that I work with have started dieting way younger than 11 years old. Yeah, fourth grade. They, yeah. They've started really young because... No. Mm -hmm. Um, mothers are also afraid that their kids are going to be fat and so they don't want their kids to be ostracized and they don't want their kids so then they start the dieting cycle which starts the binging cycle because diet binge is one cycle mm. and so it starts early out of care out of concern mm. uh, and also because we're products of this culture that we live in yeah. which is so focused on what you look like and the size of your thighs. So can I ask you a personal question? Yes, you can. I didn't know I was going to do this. <laughs> um, what has it been like for you as a woman, you know, including a young woman, let's say, or a girl even growing up, to have this intensity of emphasis on and the linkage between what you're worth and what you look like? Like, what's that feel like? I'm just imagining it must feel oppressive and irritating and kind of alienating and well it's felt awful but you have to remember that most girls and women mm. until they question it mm. don't question it and so there's not even an mm. active sense mm. that it could be different now some people rebel against it mm -hmm. so for instance 
in that series Girls with Lena Dunham, mm -hmm. she is definitely not somebody who's buying into the I need to be thin mm -hmm. to be loved and successful mm -hmm. culture. So, um, so there's a rebellion against that, but most women, let's just say girls, just take it for granted. Mm -hmm. This is what I need to do to look yeah. like. And in my own case, what started happening is I started dieting and then rebelling against it just almost as soon as I started dieting. So when I was 11, I went on my first diet. When I was 11 and three months, I went on my first binge. And thus started a cycle from 11 to 28 where I gained and lost over a 1,000 pounds in that time. Mm. Because I didn't like being judged for what I looked like. Mm. And I felt like... But it would, but you know, when you're 11 years old, mm. it's very hard to say these things out loud. So you, but you feel like, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm worth more than this. Mm. Um, this isn't, this isn't all I am. And so there's a rebellion, mm. and that's not just what binges are. Yeah. They're not just I'm worth more than this. Mm. I'm, you know, I am more than my body. They are also. I, I'm not willing to be restricted like this mm -hmm, sure. and so I'm gonna break out mm -hmm. and so there's diet binge and then you feel bad and then mm -hmm. you feel like you have to restrict and you have to go back on a diet and after a while what happens to girls mm -hmm. who then turn into women of mm -hmm. course is that they feel like they can't trust themselves mm -hmm. they can't trust their needs mm -hmm. what they really truly want because hunger and needs are very related to each other. And so you start feeling like my hunger is bottomless. I can't trust mm. what I want, what I need. If I allowed myself to really express and or have mm. and fill my need, I devour the universe. So there's a bottomlessness. When I work with women and I work with them mm. from 18 to 80 basically, mm. Mm -hmm. they almost always say the same thing. Mm. and. And this is why eating is such a, the relationship with food is such a fabulous portal. Mm -hmm. It's a microcosm. Yeah. Because what do they say? Wow, I can't listen to my hunger. If I actually ate what my body really wanted, or they say what I wanted, I'd never stop eating. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know when to stop. Mm -hmm. And your body tells you when to stop. So I want to just kind of restate a little bit what you've said. And That's what I like about you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that you sort of reframe, restate, make it clear. I like that. Oh, well, not even to make it clear because you're really very clear and, and powerful. I'm, so what I'm hearing you say in part is women, girls, often, commonly, I mean, you're talking about 80%. At this yes. point, of you know, nine-year-old girls in America or in the West have some kind of preoccupation with their weight that you're willing to call a diet in fourth grade. Yeah, that's a lot. So, a lot of uh, girls and women uh, develop this relationship with this primal want or need to eat that becomes very problematic. In part, and and they go through cycles of you could say what you seem to be saying of guardrail to guardrail, extreme to extreme. Well, they're either denying the need or utterly indulging it and swinging back and forth. And then the broader point you just made a moment ago, and my ears really perked up, is in a sense you're implying that the problems that emerge around that core need for food and sustenance start to contaminate how women handle their needs broadly, yes. including presumably in relationships. Yes. Okay, so going with that idea then, kind of broadening it more into relationships, what do you see happens, or the ways in which these issues around eating mess women up around getting their needs met in general? Yeah. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one thing that I see all the way through, and that is not going to come as a surprise to you because of your work with taking in the good mm -hmm. and bless uh, and also what you know and what you teach about the brain and being on reactive response mm -hmm. and also one of the core needs for satiety. You know my material. Wow, you're getting <laughs> A. You're reading. Okay, good, okay. I love your work. So the core need of for satiety. Yeah. Um, fullness, satiety, fullness. Yes, yeah. so that's what I'm going to, that's just yeah. what I'm going to address right yeah. now yeah. is this belief that I don't, I, I am not enough. Mm. 
I don't have enough. Yeah. I can't get enough. Mm. I am not enough. There is not enough for me. Mm. So we're always looking, in Eckhart Tolle's words, for the next more. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens in relationship is, and this has to do with taking in the good and mm -hmm. also not having enough, is that we don't see what we do have, only what we don't have. Mm -hmm. um, we don't see what is there, only what's not there. So I can focus, I've been with my husband for 26 years, and depending on the, uh, if I am, you know, what I call it, identified with one of my very early structures, I'm only seeing what isn't enough. Mm. But if I stop myself mm. and say, hold it, wait a second, or if I do one of your practices, take in the good, mm -hmm. and I think I've told you I've added a hand motion to that because it actually helps me That's do cool. it, you really take it in. I really take it in. Mm. Then it's as if my brain just flips into what's here and what's enough. Mm. And my the whole tone of my relationship to myself mm -hmm. and with him changes mm. in that moment. Mm. And that would be the same with food. Mm. I mean, I like bringing it back to food. I can because I can see when somebody's eating and we do these eating meditations in my live retreats all the time and they're fabulous mm -hmm. and they are just very alive and so somebody is looking at the food on their plate they're taking the the fork up to their mouth they're putting it in their mouth and then the fork goes immediately down for the next bite and no focus on the food in their mouth yeah so the next one is always going to be better than this one mm. And when you don't take this one in, there's mm -hmm. no possibility of ever having enough. So if you're not willing, let's. And this is why, again, why food is so great. You just think about it. If you're not tasting the food that's in your mouth and you're not letting yourself have it, I call it really letting yourself have what you already have. Mm -hmm. If you're not letting yourself have it, then you're going to want more of it. Yeah. Because this one went by in a flash. Yeah. So you want another one, and then you want another one, and then you want another one, and there's just no sense of enough. Mm. And that's the same in relationships, too. I mean, it's a little different mm. thing, mm -hmm. um, because it's not about something as concrete as food. Mm. But still, if I'm not letting myself have what I have, if I'm missing the interaction with you right now, I mean, I could be so focused on what I'm saying, mm -hmm. and okay, what's Rick going to ask me next, and what's mm -hmm. the next question, and mm -hmm. you know, what you know, how is this going, and right, what's right, happening, right. and does right. my hair look okay, right. and you know, then I'm not really taking in, because this moment now is a moment in mm -hmm. our lives, and it's mm -hmm. never coming again, right. and if we miss it, it's mm -hmm. gone. And so I want to be here for this too. And the only way of being here is to really show up and take it in and become aware yeah, that's really true. of it's happening. So that was a long No, that's sweet. To you. So, so back to it though. So we have our prototypical <laughs> woman, right? Who's, got, who's a perfectly normal person and who has uh, this very normal, messed up relationship to food. Okay. And I'm wondering how would her hypothetical issues around food contaminate her capacity to, let's say, assert herself in intimate relationships to get her needs met, to feel like she deserves good treatment or respect? I'm going to be one of those hypothetical women. I feel bad mm -hmm. about my body. Mm -hmm. I feel ashamed about the size of my thighs or my arms. I feel like I can't. Am I fat? What? 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 What do you think, Rick? Do, do you? You know, a lot of women ask their spouses, mm -hmm. "Do I look fat in this? Do you think I look fat? What do you think about that?" There's a sense of not being good enough. There's a sense of. Uh, uh, disempowerment that's a very big word but there's a there's there's a way that when a woman doesn't feel good mm -hmm. about her body which is let's face it the world she's walking around in mm -hmm. so this is this is it this is the vehicle mm -hmm. through which Everything has to be expressed. We, we are right. human bodies. So if right. I'm walking around mm. diminishing mm. 
this vehicle constantly yeah. mm -hmm. and ashamed yeah. of myself. And yeah. also, if all my energy mm -hmm. is going into what I look like, how mm -hmm. much I eat, how much I shouldn't have eaten, mm -hmm. how much I want to eat, what my life will finally be like mm -hmm. when I lose weight, mm -hmm. if only I were thin, then I would be right. happy. Not being in the present, obviously. At all. Mm -hmm. At all. Yeah. Then there's there is a very diminished capacity mm -hmm. for relationship, for true relationship. Because people are preoccupied with this inner dialogue and story and, so, and judging themselves and trying to imagine what other people are saying. And of course it's all framed, going back to blame and the voice, you know, it's all framed in this really negative way, right? And yes, and not feeling like I deserve more yeah. because I can't control myself. I'm mm. eating too much. I can't mm. stop. I said I was going to... It's a character disorder. That's right. right. You're it pathetic. Be, that's right. You can't right. control your impulses. Right. That, yes. Mm. Right. Right, right. That's how it comes up for Yes. People. I didn't really mean that, obviously, but that's how it no, lands. No, no. I, that's how it lands. Yeah. And so yeah. somebody is wrapped up in that and feeling bad about that mm -hmm. and unable mm -hmm. to or unwilling to or doesn't feel that she has the capacity to... Yeah ask for what she needs because then right. again if I'm judging my needs as bottomless yeah. then I feel like I'm too intense uh -huh. yeah. I'm too needy I'm mm -hmm. too sensitive I'm always asking for too much just mm -hmm. like I fill in the blank with yeah. food yeah yeah that's that contamination thing it just leaks into this whole world so I'm imagining that there you are a person who's feeling inadequate and uh, about herself let's say and also thinking back on to Eric Erickson, his models of adult development or life development, shame, he says, comes down to that which should be hidden is exposed. You know, he goes in his very Freudian way to toilet training, of course, but um, you're really talking about people who feel like that which should be hidden, you know, my belly roll, speaking of myself, or my five extra pounds, whatever, is somehow seen, and I'm, I'm embarrassed about that. So right. it's like moving through life with... Uh, as if there's a wind sail behind you that's slowing you down always. You know, that you're always swimming kind of upstream in terms of a sense of worth and freedom and swinging out and what you deserve from life and other people. Right. right. You, you end up feeling like um, you're hidden. How I felt, because I, I mm. did a lot of swinging from, well, not a lot. At mm. one point in my life for a year and a half, I was anorexic and weighed 80 pounds. Mm. And then I couldn't stand it anymore. How tall are you? 5'2". So 80 pounds is very, very thin. Very thin. And then, a couple months later, I went wild on binges. Uh, and I gained 80 pounds in two months. Wow. So I so doubled have... my weight yeah. in two months. Mm. And I felt so ashamed of myself, mm. crippled. Mm. And I felt with being overweight, which I was most of my life, overweight, not the anorexia was sort of an, an anomaly. Mm -hmm. I felt that I was hiding myself uh, beneath my fat, and I didn't want people to really see me. Yeah. And there was something scary about being thin, mm -hmm. because when I lost weight, even though everybody says, I want to be thin, I want to be thin, I want to be thin, people who feel they are... Um, obsessed or challenged about food mm -hmm. what they really believe is if only I were thin then everything that's wrong would be right mm -hmm. except what they don't realize is that they're using food mm -hmm. for for very good reasons really yeah. so thinking about this now um, let's say for women who are caught up in this and you and clearly it's a lot of women if not the majority women you know in the West put it bring it into a workplace setting so let's say a woman, um, you know, of any age really, caught up in, in self-esteem issues or self-worth issues related to appearance in a workplace setting, in career, job, asserting herself, working with others, um, aiming high, or et cetera. Um, how would issues around food, diet, self-image, and so forth show up in various ways in workplace environments? One of the ways it almost always shows up and I know this isn't what you're asking, but I'm going to say it anyway, is what I call joining the suffering club. That um, um, people connect 
women often, but, I, you know, perhaps men, I don't know about the workplace environment with men and women, but I know this is true with women because I hear it all the time in my workshops and retreats mm -hmm. that the way they connect is, well, what diet have you been on? And what are you eating this week? And what are you eating? And, oh, you've lost weight. What did you do mm -hmm. to lose that weight? Yeah. And then if somebody loses weight and they're eating, let's say, because I really recommend that people listen to their, their hungers. Mm -hmm. Um, and figure out what's best for their bodies. And mm -hmm. everybody's needs are different, yeah. body-wise. Somebody loses weight, then there's envy. Mm. And then there's mm -hmm. um, losing connection. Mm -hmm. yeah. And losing your pals. Mm -hmm. And so there's a push-pull with yeah. that. There's a, I don't want to lose my pals. Yeah. And this is how we connect, through talking about what we're all eating. Mm. And how much weight we have yet to lose and what our lives are going to be like when we lose that weight. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of on the outside. Mm -hmm. That's the most, in some way, the most obvious okay. mm -hmm. of connections. But, it, but it's the same connection all the way through when you don't feel good about yourself, mm -hmm. when you feel some kind of um, shame about mm -hmm. yourself then you're less likely to, to feel like you deserve what you actually a promotion, yes. a raise, right. a chance at a project, right. the opportunity to speak first in a meeting rather than last. Right, you know, right. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. now, these are, I, I do want to say, I know this is a very broad generalization, and there are a lot of women who do not feel like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's important to say that. Good. Because in my retreats, um, and these are people who come back often, because I, they, they use it as their practice in a way mm -hmm. when they no longer have issues with food I see a lot of high powered women mm -hmm. and they were high powered when they walked in mm -hmm. and they're even more high powered mm -hmm. when they work with this so it hasn't kept them from being doctors and psychiatrists mm -hmm. and kidney surgeons mm -hmm. and it hasn't kept them but it's kept them down in some way because mm -hmm. think about it anytime you're preoccupied yeah Anytime you have shame about mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. then it's 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 a tangle inside you sure. in some way. It's a it eats your energy. It, it's yeah. a space taker upper, but it's an energy drain. Yeah, totally true. Yeah, yeah. So, so then, um, so how do you see issues of uh, food desire and body image affecting men? The other half of the population. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys. Well, um, a lot of people ask me this, and a lot of people, a lot of men in particular, uh -huh. write me emails and uh, come up on my Facebook page, sort of, how come this book is called Women, Food, and God? What about men? We're here, too. We have yeah. issues with food. And, you know, I, I, because I speak from my own personal experience... Mm -hmm. And because I've mostly worked with women, mm -hmm. uh, when I started my first group many years ago in 1978 in Santa Cruz, not one man mm -hmm. came to that group. Mm -hmm. And so I started speaking generally to and for women. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's similar, particularly, uh, so similar on one level. When there's an emphasis on appearance and where there's an emphasis on being judged, valued, identified, mm -hmm. and promoted yeah. based on what you look like, mm -hmm. then when you don't fit into that mold, so mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. it's affecting. Mm -hmm. So, And it's affecting no matter what your gender is. Yeah. Right. Men, for the most part, again, I'm treading in... Generalizing. Very but. sensitive territory here. That men, for the most part, feel like... I mean, think Jack Nicholson. Mm -hmm. Think John Goodman. Mm -hmm. Think Marlon Brando. Mm -hmm. Th let's just take sort of the most obvious um, movie star icons mm -hmm. here. Do you know a, a woman movie star who could have been as big as... Marlon Brando, John Goodman, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a whole host of other men who have have either put on weight over the years mm -hmm. or never were thin to begin with, and they were very successful. Mm -hmm. If a woman actress is successful, it's it the, her weight is part of it usually yeah. most of the time. 
So um, mm-hmm. a man can gain 10 pounds and feel still great. Yeah. Can feel like, ah, oh, mm-hmm. I need to lose 10 pounds. I need to lose 20 pounds. Then I gained right. a little weight. So I have a big belly. Ah, big deal. I look like a Buddha now. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I don't think a man is so identified uh-huh. and defines himself. I yeah. am what I weigh. Yeah. So much or as much as yeah. a woman does. You know, it's interesting. Um, I don't know if you've come across this kind of terminology, but uh, in gender studies, uh, it's the distinction. A distinction is often used between instrumental and ornamental, oh. right there. And so, in classically, again, men across so many cultures are socialized to be instrumental. In other words, they make things happen. You think about toys for boys; they really emphasize construction. You're right. making things happen. And men are judged on how in successfully instrumental they are. Did you build that business? Did you win that race? Did you make that house go up? Did you, uh, were you the victor in that combat of some kind? Okay. Whereas women, ornamental. How yes. do you look? That's what you're yes. talking about. Yes. And it's pervasive. So, yes. uh, and it's really, it's in the socialization, so it gets internalized. Yes. And that's where the term from... Um, diversity work often comes up too for me internalized oppression it's a fancy term but it really says it doesn't it yes it does oppression so you internalize these messages and then you also live in a culture in which bottom line you know you're going to be judged on your ornamentality as it were yes as a woman so and that's just kind of a pervading emphasis or at least minimally a question in the back of your mind you know yes you're going to your point about what you carry as you go through your life. Yes. Yeah, so I think you're completely right and consistent with what a lot of research shows in terms of generalizations, to be sure, many exceptions, da, da. but in terms of the center mass of the distribution, it's very much what you described. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we could take this now to a kind of another level, which I have found actually, Janine, honestly, one of the most interesting and cool things about your work. So obviously it's neat to address the, you know, uh, just top layer of absurdity of food obsession and preoccupation with th- 30 days to thinner thighs. I swear that I could write a book with the title, How to, How to Lose Weight and Make Money While You Sleep, and it would sell millions, of course. <laughs> um, but you've taken it to a deeper level. Uh-huh. You really have gotten out. What do we truly long for deep down? You know, yes. What do we really want? How is eating sometimes a kind of substitute gratification for what we most deeply long for in our heart. And I wondered if you could talk more about that. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that what what I long for, what the people I work with long for, I think probably what most of us long for, is to feel like we belong on this earth, that we are inhabiting the lives we've mm-hmm. been given. Mm-hmm. And if you don't inhabit your body, it's very hard to really feel like you're inhabiting your life Mm. because this is the vehicle through which life is being lived Mm. and if you're hating it judging it leaving it Mm. going up and out of it Mm. which is what many many of the people that i work with do and what i did Mm. for the longest time Mm. then it's hard to feel like you're actually here on earth and living this, you know, as Mary Oliver says, this, what are you going to do with your one wild and precious life? Mm-hmm. That you're living this one wild and precious life yeah, of yours. Yeah, definitely. And mm-hmm. so, you know, there have been so many pieces going around the internet with the five things that people most regret when they're dying. And they're often different five things. But... There's, I've noticed, and I'm always interested in those because mm-hmm. I've been preoccupied mm-hmm. with, with dying? death. No, really? Uh-oh. <laughs> well, not with dying so much as knowing from a very early age that this is temporary. It's gone in a second. Mm. And, uh, you know, basically we're here for 10 minutes. And because uh, and, it goes that fast. Mm. So, so if that's true, and what I've seen in these five regrets of people who are dying, is that many of them speak to, I wish I was there for the ordinary moments. Mm. I wish, it's not about, and I say this to my students all the time, I promise you, when you are dying, you are not going to wish your thighs were thinner. Mm. 
You are not going to wish you had less cellulite. You are not going to wish you, you spent more time on a diet. What you will want back are all the moments that you spent not liking your thighs that you could have spent smelling your kids necks mm. you know mm. just being outside looking mm. at the stars smelling yeah. the air hearing mm. the birds mm. doing what you love being in your body when you walk mm. uh, yeah. talking when you talk mm. showing up when you're getting interviewed by Rick Hansen uh-huh. um, so mm-hmm. so you'll want that back yeah and 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 it's gone and you can't get it because you wasted it that's right and so I always sort of start at the end mm. and then zoom back in and say, okay, we all know people who have died. I mean, my list of the people I know and loved who have died is very long at this point. Mm. And somehow we don't think it's actually going to happen to us. And, and so if you just even get it that death is actually real, it will happen sometime. It's happening all around us come back and just say okay all right what is it how is it that I want to live now Mm -hmm. and what am I missing Mm -hmm. that I can actually show up for now and this has to do with food it has everything to do with food because people are saying constantly uh, I wish I could eat this and I wish I could eat that and if only and as I said before if only I were thin but they're not taking in when well, I do an exercise with people in my workshops where they actually focused on one piece of chocolate mm-hmm. one piece mm-hmm. and what invariably people say is a version of I've eaten bags of these but I've never eaten one of these yeah I've yeah. never allowed myself mm-hmm. to actually have what I have right so that's what how mm. I see this gets back to mm. what we long for is to have the life we have mm. not be someone else not yeah. try to be someone else you know there's that famous Oscar Wilde line where he says be yourself everyone else is taken right and uh-huh. so I think I think it's coming back to living the life that we've been given hmm. you're to me, I, mean, I think of the title of a book I've, I read, I saw recently called "Eating the Moment." In other words, you're talking about um, our deep hunger to feel fed and fulfilled and filled by ordinary experiences, generally speaking. Because yes. most of life, on you know, the zero to ten intensity scale, it's ones and twos and threes, if not point fours. You know. Yeah. So we want to feel fed. The irony is we don't feel fed, including fed by feelings of worth and feeling loved and feeling included and wanted. Um, so we end up trying to meet that need by stuffing food down our face. Right? Yes. But even now we hardly feel fed by. We and don't. We miss a, it. It's a phony food. It's a fool's gold. Yes. It's plastic. It doesn't yes. really help us. It doesn't, does, it doesn't nourish us in the deepest way possible. So you're talking about taking in real nutrients, as it were, real nourishment in terms of experiences right of this moment the smell of your baby's neck or that was cool actually you said that uh, let alone the taste of this chocolate in this mouth in this moment you're talking about really really taking that in satisfying that hungry deep down which will then be less preoccupied with appearance weight being ornamental or what have you yes because if you actually took it in let's just say on the food level Mm -hmm. because that's the microcosmic level because Mm -hmm. how you eat is how you live or Mm -hmm. how you do anything is how you do everything so if you took it in then you could see oh does this food actually space me out Mm -hmm. give me a headache make me feel depressed um, drain my energy or does it give me energy if you were actually paying attention Mm -hmm. you would eat differently than Mm -hmm. you do you wouldn't be focused on the food in your head Mm -hmm. you would be focused on how does does your body feel alive now or does it feel dead that would change your relationship Mm -hmm. with food right Mm -hmm. there Mm -hmm. that would change it if you were willing to pay attention Mm -hmm to it and not keep going for the next bite but then you know I've heard you talk about your three I am safe 
I am loved, I have enough. Yeah. Those three yeah, yeah. practices. The big three. The big three. Our three deep needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection. Yes. Yeah, and they're the sense that, okay, at a basic level, these core needs are already met. And that's yeah. what we're and talking about. And I'm coming about. from them already being met. That's right. As I engage life. That's and you're right. you're saying that. I'm yeah. saying that in a different way, yeah. but, you know. So I'm going to give you a tough one, okay? So uh -oh. let's, let's say, uh -oh. let's say that um, I'm a person, statistically I'm probably a woman, who, uh, you know, worries about my appearance and I'm in a relationship, let's say, further, could be with another woman even, or a man, probably a man in this case, uh, who's kind of a little critical of how I look and wishes I actually did lose 10 pounds, okay, and um, I you know, I had this voice inside my head from growing up, my critical parent who was kind of nagging on me because I was a little, if I dare use the word, chubby going through junior high school or high school. And so I had that internally. And I'm not a total nut about all this, but I'm, I'm suffering, I'm struggling, and I'm, I'm habitual about it. I secretly eat cookies, you know, I hide little bits of food. I feel really bad about it. So we had a little technical glitch there, but we're back here. So now I'm going to reset the question. The question is, let's suppose that I am a woman and I'm self-critical. Uh, I'm in a relationship with someone my partner is, a little bit on my case. Let's say it's a heterosexual relationship. He's not a total jerk, but he's kind of a nag about wishing I weighed 10 pounds less. I've got a lot of self-criticism inside my mind from growing up maybe with critical parents including critical about what I looked like and um, you know I, I sneak food occasionally and I kind of worry about what I wear and how big I am or not and what can I do okay let's suppose I've read a Janine Roth book and I'm self aware more aware of this the voice in my head but practically what are your top three four five things I can actually do to uh, to cope and to change and to transform and to get free related to food and eating and weight? Asking what you can do is a very good question because insight is not enough. It's insight and then taking action. Realizing you have a choice okay. about what you do and then acting on mm -hmm. what you see. Mm -hmm. It also takes support to do that. So I really recommend having support and I'll go back to that in a second. Okay. In, terms of, in terms of your husband, Rick, that you've talked about, <laughs> in terms of, you know, your husband who's criticizing yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. That he's not one. a total jerk. That one. You yeah, know, that no, one. he's not a total jerk. I know he's a nice guy, otherwise you, you know, but you wouldn't have hired him. Yes. He needs to know. So we had a little technical glitch there, but we're back here. So now I'm going to reset the question. The question is, let's suppose that I am a woman and I'm self-critical, uh, I'm in a relationship with someone my partner is, a little bit on my case, let's say it's a heterosexual relationship, he's not a total jerk, but he's kind of a nag about wishing I weighed 10 pounds less. I've got a lot of self-criticism inside my mind from growing up maybe with critical parents, including critical about what I looked like. and. Um, you know, I, I sneak food occasionally and I kind of worry about what I wear and how big I am or not and what can I do? Okay, let's suppose I've read a Janine Roth book and I'm self -aware, more aware of this, the voice in my head, but practically, what are your top three, four, five things I can actually do to, uh, to cope and to change and to transform and to get free related to food and eating and weight? Asking what you can do is a very good question because insight is not enough. It's insight and then taking action. Realizing you have a choice okay. about what you do and then acting on mm. what you see. Mm. It also takes support to do that. So I really recommend having support and I'll go back to that in a second. Okay. In, terms of, in terms of your husband, Rick, that you've talked about. <laughs> You know, your husband who's criticizing yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one. He's not one. a total jerk. That one. You yeah, know, that no, one. he's not a total jerk. I know he's a nice guy. Otherwise, you, you know, but you wouldn't have hired issues. him. Yes. He needs to know that your body is your body. Right. And he doesn't get to comment on your body. 
Really? He doesn't. Yes. No commenting really. allowed. No. Nope. Comment free zone. No, no commenting allowed. Mm. Commenting, besides anything else, commenting does not help you. Yeah. Commenting makes you feel worse, and then commenting makes you sneak food. Yep. That's right. So, That's what I do. And, uh, yes, I know you said that. And so one of my eating guidelines, and I'm going to talk about those in a second, is eat with the intention of being in full view of other people. Because mm. when you see It goes back to that which should be hidden is now revealed. That takes a lot of courage. It do does. That. But once you realize that what you're saying when you sneak food is, mm. if they saw me, they wouldn't love me. Who I am cannot be seen in full view. Mm. Therefore, I must hide and therefore I must sneak. Mm. Th that's the beauty of working on any level, really, using anything as a portal. Yeah. But that's the beauty of it. And so, the, the, so not to sneak. But again, it's making a commitment to yourself mm. to follow some of the eating guidelines. And they are very simple. They are eat when you're hungry. Eat when you're hungry. Makes sense. That's okay. what food is for. And don't eat when you're not hungry. Is that true? <laughs> well, so the corollary of that is eat what your body wants mm -hmm. when it's hungry and feel and or be aware of what you feel when you're not hungry. So it works. Yes, it does work on both levels. Very good, Rick. <laughs> you caught that one. <laughs> Yes, because this is a multi-level process. Yeah. It's not just about eating when you're hungry. The eating guidelines are really about mindfulness and paying attention. They're really about that. Pay attention. So cutting to the chase, how do you resource yourself when you're not, your body's not hungry, but your mind craves food? The repetition, the comfort, the soothing, the escape. Uh, the poor person's antidepressant because as we eat and sugar levels rise, it helps you know transfer uh, serotonin in the brain, right? Yes. How do you overcome your desire to eat at that point? It's not. I don't look at it as overcoming okay. your desire. Great. I look at it as mm -hmm. backdooring into what you used, resourcing yourself. Yeah. How do you resource yourself so to you, manage that moment? Yes. You, not in that moment, but in all the other moments of your life, or at least regular moments yeah. of your life, yeah. you have support of some kind. Mm -hmm. You begin to understand... Other people, books, groups... Books, CDs, audio courses, friends, friends. friends buddies, we have buddies, yeah. uh, where you talk to your buddy two or three times a week. Mm -hmm. And there is some kind of support you're getting mm -hmm. s regularly, I'm yeah. talking regularly, so that you can glimpse yeah. and taste, so to mm -hmm. speak, that there is another way to live that mm -hmm. is so much better. And you have these people inside you in a good way. Not just having the kind of toxic shame voice inside no, you. No, no, no. But you no. have your friends inside you. As they say in Alcoholics Anonymous, the mind is a dangerous neighborhood, never going alone, right? Yes. So you're talking about resourcing yourself with internalized allies and friends who are cheering you on. And realizing there's something better mm. than putting that food in your mouth at that moment. Because mm. as soon as you want to eat, it gets to the point mm. where when you want to eat and you're not hungry, you you realize I'm going to feel worse. Yeah. So I am now about to double my suffering instead of make it go away. Mm -hmm. And when you have repeated experiences of that, mm -hmm. not in that moment, yeah. but in other moments, yeah. then that comes up and mm -hmm. you stop wanting to do that. I've seen it happen hundreds, mm -hmm. really tens of thousands of times. So yeah. I know... I know that yeah, that's possible. Yeah. Also, I'm sure people are realizing this too. You can generalize from from what you're talking about food to other desires of various kinds. Yes. Alcohol, drugs, um, other kinds of things, uh, or emotional desires that would get kind of hooked on, you know, like just dumping anger on other people. Yes. That uh, it's gratifying maybe in the moment, just like, you know, eating a cupcake is gratifying in the moment, but you pay a price. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you definitely pay a price, and people know that. They feel awful about themselves. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what are a couple other concrete practical tips? We just have a few more minutes here. I'm wondering if you have some other good advice for me, the woman who, you know, has the not total jerk but overly critical guy in her life and I'm worried on, about on, my ten extra pounds. On a very superficial and appearance oriented level, mm -hmm. which is not the level we've been talking on at all. Yeah. I would recommend, Rick, that you buy some clothes that fit you, that you really like. Well, and so that you... You don't think I should just punish you, myself you, for not weighing the right And squeeze in to clothes that don't fit you so that yeah. you are walking around in clothes. When I was, yeah. you know, after I'd gained those 80 pounds, I had one dress. Yeah. That was a summer dress and it was wintertime. And it had sleeves and a, a sleeveless and an elastic waist. And I wouldn't buy any clothes that I felt good in. So, so that's completely... Good. On an external mm -hmm. level, I think the main thing is support mm -hmm. and also having mm -hmm. action steps, taking very small steps. So deciding mm -hmm. three times this week or four times this week, mm -hmm. I am going to. Now, it could be a buddy. I'm going to eat when I'm hungry. I'm going to mm. eat sitting down. Mm. And I'm not going to eat in my car. I am not going to sneak. Just taking very small steps. Mm on the eating level, yeah. but then also making sure that every avenue of support you could possibly get, and that does include mm. CDs, books, friends, I mean mm. every resource, mm. you saturate yourself in that. Mm. You eat wisdom. Yes. In a sense. Right. And you really let it, you digest it, you yes. metabolize it, you help it sink in, and you also, in a way, eat love. Even imperfect, you know, perfect love, imperfect relationships, right? You know, you just you internalize support. You're talking about internalizing that which is healthy, which tends to crowd out the cravings yes. to, to consume what's unhealthy. And you have a good time. So I so you take delight mm -hmm. and joy, yeah. pleasure. Mm -hmm. You know, you eat because food is also meant to be delicious. Yeah. So it's not this scientific experiment yeah, where yeah. you can only you know eat this amount of carbs and this amount of fat and this amount of protein. Really, you make it pleasurable so that it's a source of delight because uh -huh. it is supposed to be that too. You're probably you're saying lighten up. It's just food. <laughs> you know, trust your body. It'll yes. do the right thing. Get yes. your mind out of the business and lighten up about it all. Yes. Take mm. some joy. Let it mm. be, you know, again, a Mary Oliver poem. This is mm. what I was born for, to instruct myself in joy and acclamation. Joy and acclamation? Acclamation. Acclamating, no, yes. adapting. No, just acclaiming. Oh, acclaiming. Joy yes. and acclaiming. Yes, oh, okay, yes, great. yes. The loveliness of it yeah. all. Yeah, well, that's great. You know, as we move to an end here, I'm very struck by uh, courage. And the kind of, you haven't used that word yet, but it's really implicit in what you're teaching here. The courage it takes to get on your own side, to stand up against the voices outside you that are saying, be more ornamental, be more ornamental, or whatever. Um, and the courage it takes to kind of take on these desires. The courage it takes to go public with your eating and to not hide about it. And the courage to come out into the world, you know, being 10 pounds more than, you know, some swimsuit model. And that's the heck with it, right? Yes. It's courage. How do people find that courage and grow that courage? Well, I don't think How did it's... How you do it? I don't think it's something that you find. I think it's something that people have and I think it's about calling it up mm -hmm. because we're suffering without it mm -hmm. and so I, I mean I know this is a very simplistic view and it, it it's mm -hmm. not this simplistic but we're suffering mm -hmm. and yeah, we're suffering people that are challenged and obsessed around food are suffering blaming themselves feeling bad about themselves this is you know, on a very simple level, are you willing to act on your own behalf here? It takes strength and gumption and courage. It does. Yeah. But, and, um, suffering is very difficult. It's, it's the same old patterns. Mm -hmm. It's winding around in that same old neural circuitry. Mm -hmm. But it's also very painful. Yeah. And it's it's not like one avenue is great and happy and the mm -hmm. next avenue takes a lot of courage mm -hmm. and gumption and this one's easy and this one is hard. Mm -hmm. That one's hard too. Yeah. Yeah, got it. 
Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I think about the definition of wisdom of choosing a higher happiness over a lesser happiness, right? A greater happiness over yes, a smaller right, happiness. Yes, right, right. Um, well, my last question then for you, all right? It's the one I ask everybody. Uh, looking out at the world, you travel a lot, you've seen a lot of the world. Uh, if you could name one practice for some critical mass of human brains, I think about a billion brains, right? Anyway, some critical mass, some practice that would take five minutes or less a day that a critical mass of brains would do, that people would do worldwide every day for five minutes or less, what would be that one practice that you would name or you would nominate um, for the planet? <laughs> I would... Uh, nominate the practice of enoughness. I would nominate landing in yourself and your body and seeing what you have, what you already have, mm. what enough, the enough that you already have. Mm. Because coming from that fundamental sense of lack mm. is causing a lot of suffering everywhere. Yes. In our bodies, on the planet, I mean, the poor earth, I feel, is groaning yeah. from this more, 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 more. Yeah. And so are we. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's the practice that I would nominate. Mm. Well, very beautiful, lovely ending. And thank you so much for talking with me. And I encourage people to check out Janine's work at JanineRoth.com and her courses, both online and in person, her writings and all the rest of that. And I do hope you keep writing because you have a unique and special and very important voice. I will keep writing. That's great. So thank you. And thanks, everyone, for being a participant in this. And hope you like this little side-by-side -side format. <laughs> Who knows? We might even do more of it. You never it was know. fun. That was great. Okay. Yeah. Over. Here.